Hello everybody, welcome back to the Mover Mailbag. Happy Friday, hope you're having a great week. We're gonna take some of your questions from email today. No uh, letters or packages, so to speak. Then in this video, I'll address something that's kind of mailbag related. I got a lot of messages about it, but it was Instagram related uh, earlier this week, and there's a couple points I wanna address. I hope you guys enjoy this video, thanks for watching. All right, the first message comes from Hirsch. Subject is fighter pilot. Hi, C.W. Lemoyne. This is a fan and subscriber of yours as a gearhead, aviation geek, and a gamer. I'm looking into becoming a fighter pilot for quite some years now, and I have two questions. The first questions might sound a bit stupid, but oh well. My first question is, I've always wondered that when you join the Air Force, you, get, you first get to pilot an F-16, but then how do you get to pilot another aircraft like F-15, F-35, F-22, B-2, and others? I know it also depends on your rank, do you have to show promise? Do you have to apply for a training program to that specific aircraft? Do you have to show you how capable you are in the current aircraft, or is it based on experience? My second question is, how specifically do you get into Top Gun flight school when you're a fighter pilot in the Navy? Do you have to get tip grades, I guess top grades, on a test? Do you have to show promise with your current aircraft and show that you're really determined? I really like to know. Thank you for replying in advance. Sincerely, Hirsch. So your first question. In general, flying two different fighters in a career is relatively um, uncommon. A lot, a few people have done it, um, but I'd say the majority stick to one airframe. And that's just because of training costs and, and kind of what it takes to, to do that. And how people end up flying to is, I mean, what it always comes down to, luck and timing and kind of being in the right place at the right time. Uh, in the active duty side, you can put in assignment preferences. And if you know, it just comes up and, you know, there's an opening and you apply for it. It can happen. Usually pretty common when there's a new airframe like the F-35 or F-22 where you're already in like an F-16 or an F-15 and there's F-35 openings and you've been doing well. You're an instructor pilot in your current aircraft and you apply uh, there. Also, where a lot of folks end up flying to aircraft is when they switch to guard reserve. So if you were an active duty F-16 pilot and you apply to an F-15 unit, you'll go fly the F-15. Uh, and that's the unit that likes you. They'll send you to what's called a transition course. You'll learn how to fly that and it'll be fine. So there's no real um, you know, magic way to do it. Test pilots go and fly everything. So that's one way to do it. You go to test pilot school and you get to fly a whole bunch of different aircraft uh, as part of that training. But uh, as far as uh, applying goes, uh, at least on the Guard Reserve side, you just apply to the unit you want. Uh, active duty side, it just depends on uh, what's called the VML, which is the assignments that are out. And you can apply to specific ones uh, as they come available. As far as your other question, now we're switching over to the Navy. Um, as far as uh, top, top Gun, so Top Gun is basically you have to show promise. Your commanders will put you up for that. So yes, you have to you know, be a good instructor already uh, in your fleet squadron. Uh, and, and be someone that they think will do well in the program. Same thing for weapons school in the Air Force uh, at WIC. Uh, they, they just look for people that show promise, uh, show that they have an aptitude, know the jet, know the tactics, uh, you know, stay in the books, and can prove that they will go out and succeed in the uh, training program. Shane uh, asks, interframe, inter airframe rivalries. I'm a former Marine, I leveled jet engine mech on J-52s for Prowlers. Everyone knows about our inter service rivalries, but not everyone knows how much deeper we take it. For instance, I'm a 52 mech. I have zero respect for the mechanical abil abilities of my 404 brethren. Everything for them is modular, remove and replace. Hell, they only safety wire six things on the motor. They haven't made parts for 52s since the 80s. We're working with reman parts, so I, as a 52 mech, feel vastly superior in my mechanical abilities to a 404 mech who plugs in a laptop, r and is a module. Hell, they hardly bend blades. Okay, I'm a pilot, and I have no idea what any of that means. Now, juxtapose that into the flying community. It takes service rivalry out, although I do believe Navy and Marine Corps pilots are the best. Take everything away, but you and your airframe. Do Eagle drivers talk a lot of smack? 104 to 0 airframe has a lot of juice. Do the Falcon guys talk maneuverability smack? Hornet guys? Okay, to answer that question, 104 to zero is completely irrelevant today. I mean, um, yeah, I mean, that's just a useless statistic. Yes, every airframe 
talks trash on other. It's a friendly rivalry. We don't hate each other, but I mean, you know, we call Eagle drivers Zamboni drivers because, you know, they clean out the air picture so the real players can actually go in and do the work. Um, but, you know, we, we make fun of the Navy for all, only focusing on landings. Um, they make fun of the F-16 for being a lawn dart. Uh, every, every community makes fun of another community. I mean, we, we make fun of Fat Amy for just being Fat Amy, uh, which is F-35. But yeah, every community makes fun. It's a friendly rivalry. It's not anything serious, anything personal. You know, we all, at the end of the day, will go hang out in the bar together. But uh, yeah, I mean, sure, we trash talk each other. I'm curious how the old school, new school pilots argue. I see old school intruder pilots saying to a Hornet guy, in my day, we didn't have fancy targeting computers. I used my wife's lipstick to draw crosshairs on the canopy and never missed. Uh, I'm just curious how that plays out. I, can, I can't believe I never asked a pilot. The Hornet guys walk right past my hangar every day. In my defense, I was busy. This brings me to another thing. Can Prowler pilots get some love on the channel? People don't understand how difficult it was to keep up with operational tempo when you're flying and maintain an aircraft that's 50 years old, still running turbojets. All the stories they flew to keep Sam's off you guys. I appreciate it. Uh, I kind of miss her. Uh, last thing. Yeah, I know a Prowler guy. Maybe I can get him on the channel. He was a Prowler than Hornet. Last thing. Another missed opportunity on my part was asking about dogfighting ROEs. Being a mech, you know I had FOD tattooed across my forehead. Covered 3,000 miles in five years of FOD walks. So I'm curious. I know how easy it is to FOD a motor out. So you guys have minimum engagement distance to avoid FOD strikes in a dogfight. Movies drive me nuts when a pilot flies through the debris field. Appreciate your time, sir. Simplify, Shane. Yeah, I mean, we have a 500-foot training bubble, which, I mean, if you use that in combat, it's probably a good, you know, distance. Uh, 1,000 feet to 500 feet to keep you out of uh, the frag. Yeah, it's a good question. But, yeah, training rules. We train to that all the time. So, thanks for your question. All right, this comes from Tony. Hey, Mover, back in May, the Blue Angels flew over a number of major hospitals and cities in the U.S. as a show of support for frontline medical workers. There were maps published in news media which depicted their flyover routes and times. I traced the routes using Google Maps to find the track distance for that flight. I calculated the segment of the flight. It was roughly 203 statute miles over 35 minutes. I think the top map depicting flyover times is accurate because they flew overhead within 30 seconds of my estimate. If I did my math right, that means they flew an average of 350 miles per hour or 305 knots. They were well below 10,000 feet MSL. So my question is, that sound about right? If so, does that mean they get an exception to the 250 knot restriction below 10,000 feet? as well as a 200 knot restriction in and below class Bravo, which surrounds DFW airport, which they flew directly over, or is my math hose? No, your math is right. We don't have that restriction. The DOD cooperates with the FAA, but the FAA has no actual jurisdiction over the military. We have a letter of agreement with the FAA that rescinds the 250 knot and 200 knot restriction to our NATOPS or Dash 1 minimum flying airspeed, which is 300 to 350 knots, depending on the aircraft. So we don't worry about a 250 knot restriction because we're fighters. It doesn't apply to us, just like we don't need, uh, just like a lot of fighters don't have ads B, because we don't we don't have to comply with FAA rules because we're DOD assets. So the speed restriction doesn't matter. And a lot of times you'll tell them unable. They'll try to give you something slower and you're just like unable because, and there's a reason for that. One, fighters, uh, you, you get the best view over the nose, 300 to 350 knots in most fighters. Uh, so it's for safety and maneuverability down to 250 knots. The nose is up a lot more. It's harder to see and avoid other traffic. You have less maneuverability if you need to avoid something. So it's a safety thing uh, to keep us in our tactical flying airspeed. So we don't have those restrictions uh, like a civilian airliner or something like that. So good question. I've heard this one a lot. Uh, people get confused, but we, it's not, it doesn't apply um, to us specifically. This comes from Wesley. Hi, my name is Wesley Duncan and I'm 13 years old. I aspire to become an Air Force fighter pilot. I went to, I want to go through the Air Force Academy, but I'm worried about my grades. I understand that getting good study habits is key to being able to be competitive at such a good school as my high school. Uh, he lists, it's, he lists the high school. I knew it would be difficult to make such habits, but due to the fact that I'm not actually in school, it is even more difficult than I expected. I guess that's a COVID thing with Zoom and all that. Other than my grades, I'm a well-rounded person. I play multiple sports, soccer, baseball, tennis, and instruments, trumpet, violin. I also am in Civil Air Patrol in hopes to better myself as a person and get good aviation experience. In addition to all this, I'm a huge aviation enthusiast and a big fan of your channel. I do have a couple questions, though. One, do you think the Air Force Academy is the best way to go into becoming an F-22 pilot and later a commercial pilot? Okay, first question. Um, Air Force Academy is a great commissioning source. It has nothing to do with what you fly. That's just, it just, that's not how it works. So 
that's not going to give you any more advantage than a guy off the street or a guard guy or anything like that. It is just a good way to get a pilot slot because they do have more pilot slots than other uh, commissioning sources. So um, I don't think it's the best just for that specific aircraft. The best for a specific aircraft would be to get hired by Langley or Hickam, uh, the Hawaii guard. But um, I think you, you need to focus on what's near rocks first, which is getting a pilot slot. So whether you apply to the Academy, which is a good route, uh, ROTC, which is a really good route, uh, or wait until you finish college and then do OTS or Air Guard or Air Force Reserve are also good routes. So uh, I think you need to just kind of step back and just look at uh, how you're going to get commissioned and to pilot training first. Uh, later, commercial pilot. Don't worry about commercial pilot. It's a lot later. I mean, you're talking at 13 years old. If you went through the entire process, you would have your, um, so you'd finish college at like 22. You would be 32, 33 before you're even talking commercial pilot. So, I mean, we're, we're almost 20 years away from worrying about being a commercial pilot. So I wouldn't even be thinking about that right now if your goal is to serve your country and become a fighter pilot. I just wouldn't, wouldn't worry about it. Do you think having a relationship girlfriend will affect how I perform in high school and college? Thank you for your great channel on hard work, Wesley. I, no, probably not. Um, yeah, no, I doubt it. Keep, keep doing what you're doing, man. Good, good work. All right, this comes from Ben. Uh, hey, Mover. Hello from Richmond, Virginia. I'm 16 as a sophomore in high school. I've aspired to fly ever since I was a little kid. I'm big into football and lacrosse. I have a few questions for you. One, although I dream to go to the academy, if it doesn't work out, how do you go about attaining a pilot slot before OTS? Also, I know I can go to the Google, but what about ROTC versus OTS? Would one path be easier or favorable over the other? It seems like the 10 weeks OTS might be favorable than the three to four weeks of ROTC. I don't think it's 10 weeks. It was 12 or 14 weeks before. Um, you have to look and see if that's still up to date. But ROTC is a better chance of getting a pilot slot than OTS. Because you apply, you apply to a rated board, and then they send you to OTS. Um, so as far as what's more likely, ROTC. Um, the set, the downside of ROTC is that you may end up getting something and not a pilot. So you might end up being like a navigator or some other logistics or something. Uh, OTS, you would know. And then Guard Reserve is a really good option as well. Number two. Though I'm not massive, I'm not necessarily on the skinny side. I have less fat on me than a lot of offensive linemen. I also lift a lot. How strict are the weight requirements of the military? Is there any give to them at all? I frequently run with lacrosse and some with football, but I'm also nervous of the of that 6.30 mile time. Do you struggle at all with PT tests or requirements? Thanks, Ben. Um, the height and weight stuff has recently changed. I don't even think they do the taping anymore. So uh, it's more of an ejection seat. Thing. So if you don't meet the height and weight requirements of the ejection seat, that could be a problem. Uh, 630 mile time. Uh, I don't know what that means. I, that's not a requirement at all. Uh, you don't have to run a six minute mile. It's a mile and a half PT test. Go look up the P this, this is your homework. Go look up the actual PT test standards and then see if you can pass them. And then that's what you should be working towards. Uh, there is no 630 mile time. All right. Last question comes from Vince. Hi, Mover. My name is Vance. I'm 14. Ever since I remember I've wanted to be a fighter pilot, I promised myself that I would work hard to become one. One of my problems in life is I feel there is not enough time to do all the things I want to do. That is why I would like to become a fighter pilot on active duty for about 10 years, then go into the reserves and work as a detective. I have always been good at math. For example, I'm in eighth grade and taking a high school algebra one. The reason I'm telling you that I take a high school math class is the grade I get in it will affect my high school GPA. And I would be fine with that, but I got an A minus in the class. It will bring my GPA down. Thanks to my dad, who is a teacher and had my school changed to a plus minus system instead of the AB system. The reason why I'm scared is I would like to go to the Air Force Academy. I've heard that if you go to a small school, there are 20 kids in my class. You're very selective and you have to be at the very top of your class. My vision is really bad. I can see close up, but far away, I can't see at all. But you have made me learn that I can overcome that obstacle. My question to you is what path do you think I should take? I also wanted to tell you something about my school does, and I promised myself I would go back to you every year. At our school on Veterans Day every year, all the veterans from the VAF in town come and we have an assembly and they talk and get a chance to ask questions and shake their hands. I'm asking if you could help me by telling me the best path to take. Another thing that has held me back is how my dad doesn't want me to get my pilot's license when I'm still in high school because my uncle was a pilot and almost died in a single engine plane. And he didn't tell my dad or grandparents until a couple years ago. My uncle's still alive. 
Also, my grandpa doesn't want me to go into service because his dad fought in World War II, had severe PTSD. My grandpa doesn't want to see me go through what his, he saw his dad go through. This is now the non-business stuff. I like your Corvette. I myself have a dream of owning a 1960 red Corvette. Also, say hi to the dogs. My dog, Henry, is a big black lab. Dogs are a real man's best friend. I also play guitar. I'm wondering what kind of music you like. One of the things I've been doing is buying and selling music gear online. Uh, thank you, Vince. Um, hold on, there's a part two. I just wanted to say a couple more things that I thought of. When we're, do you think playing sports and being in our classes will help me get in the Air Force Academy? Because if so, I play football, basketball, and baseball. I'm also in band, do FFA, take a pig to the fair every year, and I hope that helps me get in. Another thing is one of the reasons why I wanted the other academy is I want to be the place kicker for the football team. Okay, there's a lot to unpack here. First off, um, the Air Force Academy is great, but it is not the only way to become a fighter pilot. It is not, or become a pilot in general. So if you don't get it, apply, make them tell you no, go through all the process. If you don't get it, it's not the end of the world. You still have ROTC uh, at any good college you can go to that has pilot slots. You can still apply to OTS if that doesn't work, and you can still apply to Guard Reserve units individually, which is the one I recommend because it's a great deal if you can get hired with you know, a good fighter unit near where you want to live. So uh, as far as the other stuff goes, um, playing sports will help. Uh, doing volunteer work will help. You know, FFA, all that stuff is going to help you in general. And you can be a kicker for any team. I know a guy that was a kicker for Alabama, uh, and he uh, is an F-16 pilot now. So absolutely. Uh, as far as the private pilot's license, um, flying is safe inherently. Um, I, you, you may just have to, you know, talk to your dad and, and work on you know, showing him the safety record of aviation. And if he's not, then you have to wait until you're old enough to save up your money and stuff. I don't think you, pilot, having a pilot's license is necessarily required for ROTC or for the Air Force Academy. So if you don't get it, it's not a huge deal. Uh, maybe you can go to a college that has uh, aviation programs and do it that way. That's another option as well. Um, yeah, as far as your vision goes, make them tell you no. I mean, that's all of this comes down to don't self-eliminate. You know, if it's if it's a problem, it's going to be a problem no matter what you do. So all you can do is just go through the application process, work towards your dreams. And, you know, if, if the first person says, well, you know, you shouldn't you can't do it, then keep fighting until you find somebody that actually will give you that waiver. Um, and if it's not waiverable, then, you know, move on to something else. But thank you for the email, Vince. Uh, that was Pretty cool. That's awesome. All right. So this last part, uh, it's kind of mailbag. It's kind of not. Last Sunday, I got a whole bunch of messages. Uh, as you remember, last Friday, I did a meme review of Bob Thoughts. I uh, thought it was pretty funny. Went well. But apparently on Sunday, uh, as part of their shitpost Sunday, a couple meme pages decided to take aim at me, which ordinarily not a big deal. You know, I mean, thick skin, I can, I can take it. Um, but the problem was, you know, a lot of people messaged me about it, and it, it seemed to get a little personal and be a lot more than just shit posting. So, uh, the, one of the first pages that did it, they actually, the reason I had a problem with it was they actually used a name in one of the comments that is not public knowledge. So, my actual uh, nickname I've had since I was a kid, uh, which is not Mover, and which told me that that person actually knew me. So I went and messaged the person and asked them who they were and how they knew me. And, you know, if there were some problem, you know, that I'd uh, made them mad to cause them to, you know, do five memes uh, talking about how terrible I am. And they gave me a fake name and it turned into a lecture about how I should do more for the community and um, that I should, you know, encourage everyone to do a letter writing campaign uh, for the ejection seat in the F-16 of their congressman, and also that their plan wasn't to hate, but was actually to try to get donations for what they call flags of honor, but they meant folds of honor, uh, which they said they were going to do another post, and they never did. Uh, I thought that was a little weak, because uh, they wouldn't give me, you know, the real name. I mean, if you're going to hide behind an anonymous meme page, at least, you know, at least in private, because these are private messages, you know, have the balls to to own it up, own up to, you know, who you are and how you know me and and that kind of thing. But the other thing that came up with it that I kind of thought, well, this is more personal than um, just, you know, good fun. And I wanted to 
address some of the things that were said because really in the comments is where there was a lot of hate. I mean, just absolutely uh, vitriol from, from some of these people. And the thing was, I try not to violate rule number one, you know, don't be a douche. And I, I, throughout this channel, I've tried to, you know, be a good dude. In this business, your reputation is everything and credibility is important to me. And when it's, a, you know, when it's normal people and, you know, they, they're, they're mad or angry comments and stuff, it's not a big deal. But to me, when it's another fighter pilot or somebody, you know, one of my peers that's saying that, I do take note and I take interest. So uh, one of the comments that I saw uh, on one of the memes, the memes themselves, I mean, they weren't that bad, but one of the comments was, you know, why, what's your beef with, with Mover? And one of the meme pages, which is actually one that I'd covered, uh, on a meme Friday. So I didn't think we had any issues. They didn't have, you know, we'd, I'd messaged them before. They didn't seem to have any problems. Uh, one of the comments was he uses being a fighter pilot to clout chase for financial gain. He bamboozles good people that don't fly into thinking that this is how all fighter pilots wa uh, are. And then he also, um, on the story, said, why are you hating on C.W. Lemoyne? And he says he uses being a fighter pilot to seem cool to people that don't know any better, all while profiting from it. And I think this brings up a, a couple points that probably need to be addressed. Um, first of all, people have this weird assumption that YouTube equals you're rich. Um, it's a business just like anything else. I mean, it, it, it takes, you know, the average video takes, you know, six to nine hours. I mean, I say that, you know, jokingly, but it can take anywhere from four hours to, to do a video to 12 to 14 hours, depending on how heavy the editing is. I mean, it is a full-time job. As far as profiting, um, it is ludicrous to say that someone should do things like this for free or anything for free. Um, I, I'm not getting rich off of YouTube. Uh, I'm not, you know, I, I, no one, there was another comment in here that uh, the fans would be mad because I showed a video washing the ZR1 and they should be mad because they helped pay for that. Well, first of all, I bought the ZR1 in 2019. This channel didn't even have uh, 100,000 subscribers. I was making like two or 300 bucks a month at most at that time. It did not pay for the ZR1. I paid for the ZR1 because guess what? I'm an airline pilot. I make money. I've got a real job. So um, that's bullshit, first of all. Second, um, as far as, you know, clout chasing and profit, I started this channel back in 2018, and it was supposed to be just an author vlog to talk about, you know, writing books and, you know, cars and stuff like that. My very first video was that went anywhere, went viral, was how I became a fighter pilot. And I was very clear, and I've been very clear in this channel, I'm not special. I'm not, you know, I'm not the stereotypical fighter pilot. I'm an average dude that had a lot of good opportunities, that had people that helped me, that, um, you know, I, I kind of, it worked out for me because of the people that were around me and because, um, you know, I, I just didn't give up. And that's where the make them tell you no comes from. And I've used that to create, we've got a Facebook group with 5,700 people. Uh, we're doing mover mailbags like this uh, to help give back to the community. So to say that, you know, well, it's clout chasing and all that stuff. I'm not clout chasing. I mean, I have, uh, that's, that's the most ridiculous thing I've heard. And then to say that uh, I'm doing it for profit. Uh, last year, we raised money for charity, Folds of Honor. Every video you see has a fundraiser on it for charity. And I do that intentionally. I use this platform to try to help other. I donated a full scholarship to, to Folds of Honor last year from the money that was made uh, on these videos. I donated 100% of the profits from the uh, Mezer video, like I talked about, to Mezer's um, foundation. And you can see that if you go to the GoFundMe, you can see where I did that. Um, it, 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 the amount of money made, because remember, it's a business, so this is not free. Cameras cost money, editing software costs money, lights, all the stuff, all the improvements that I've made have all cost money as I've gone through, you know, the channel and trying to make things better. Um, I mean, the gross profits, not the net profits, but the gross is about what an O3 would make in the military, if that. I mean, it's it's not... No one, I'm not, and maybe I'm, you know, maybe my channel is not doing the monetization right. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Maybe these guys know something I don't, but I, you know, 
that's like asking them to go fly the F-16 for free. You know, I mean, just it, it, are they doing it for profit? Everybody does things for money. I mean, that's that's how the world works. You do something, YouTube pays ad revenue for, for doing that. And, you know, it's not getting rich, but I mean, it's there's nothing wrong with with making money doing that. And on that note, that was the other thing. They said that the um, mishap videos were uh, exploitative for um, for doing those. And there's there's two things. One. Uh, with the exception of two, I have talked to the families of every video that I've done um, with a fatality. Um, and they have been encouraging. They have thanked me for doing it, for shedding light on what actually happened. Um, the $5,000 donation I made to Folds of Honor personally is more than I made on any single or, or all of them combined. It's more than I made on all videos combined for ad revenue all those mishap videos, not to mention the Meser video where I donated to the foundation. I have been very careful in trying not to exploit that by showing what happened, what went on, because I think to honor their memory, to show that it's not just the headline pilot error and that's the end of it, that there's a lot more to the story than what the media says and to show it from a perspective of somebody who knows. And yes, when we did the measure video, if you remember, I did point out the ejection seat and how big of a failure that is and how that's a foul and how that is the single worst thing that could possibly happen for a fighter pilot to have that seat fail. So I don't have a problem with people, um, you know, making fun of me. I mean, I know it comes with, you know, being a public figure now and having 300,000 subscribers or close to it or whatever, but when it's lies like that, that's where I've got to, you know, stand up for it and go, that's bullshit because, uh, I'm not clout chasing. I'm not, uh, saying that I'm anything that I'm not, uh, you know, I don't go in DCS and say I'm the world's greatest fighter pilot. You know, I do those jokingly. Uh, I don't go, I don't do any videos. You know, I'm not one of those guys that opens the video with hey, I'm mover. I'm a fighter pilot. And today I'm going to explain, like, I don't, I, I don't do that. That's not who I am. I'm an average dude. I'm, I've made mistakes in my career. I've made mistakes in my life. I've made mistakes on this very vlog and this channel, but I try to learn from them and I try to not be a douche and I try to help people where I can. And I think we've done that with the make them tell you no stuff we did. You know, I spent a long time for free making the frequently asked questions that's uh, on that YouTube or on that Facebook page. And I made a YouTube video about that. Um, you know, I've, I've, we've tried to do stuff to help the community and help others. So um, you know, I, I don't know. I know there's always going to be haters. It just sucks when it's someone that's a peer that I think, you know, should be supportive and realize that this is for the, you know, drawing in the younger crowd and answering these questions and showing kids that it is possible to accomplish your goals. And it's not some unachievable dream and that, you know, you're not a robot if you're a fighter pilot and you're not, you know, you don't have to have a 4.0 perfect vision, you know, run a six minute mile and all that stuff you, it, to show that it is an achievable dream to me is important and is part of paying it back. So, um, you know, if that's a problem, then yeah, unsubscribe. That's, that's all I can tell you. You know, I, I don't, you'll never see me, not since I had like 20,000 subscribers, have I ever asked anybody to like, share or subscribe my stuff. Never do it. Uh, I don't believe in that. I don't have a Patreon. I'm not getting rich off of this. You know, that's just uh, total bullshit. So anyway. All right. So uh, that'll do it for today's Mover Mailbag. If you want to send me something, um, you can either send it to me, Mover Mailbag at cwloin.com if you want it read on the uh, channel, or you can uh, mail me something, P.O. Box 8594, Manville, Louisiana, 70470. Or if you want to send me something not for the channel, cwloin at cwloin.com. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend. Mm -hmm.